So Hare Krishna everyone, welcome to the Power of Inspiration class. Very to, happy to have your association. So today we're going to read from Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 7. Chapter 11, texts 26 and 27. Again, that's seventh canto, chapter 11, texts 26 and 27. So please turn to the page and let's read together. I will read the Sanskrit and the word for word synonyms and the translation. There is no purport, so we're going to go back to 71125 and go over that purport again because it's a very important purport. Samarjano Palepa Vyang Rihamandana Vartanai Swayang Shamandita Nityang Parim Rishta Parichada Kamair Uchavachai Sadvi Prashrayena Damanacha Bhakyai satyai priyai premna Kale kale bhajets bhajet patim Samarjana by cleaning Upale pabyam by smearing with water or other cleansing liquids Riha the household Mandana Decorating. Bartanai. Remaining at home and engaged in such duties. Swayam. Personally. Cha. Also. Mandita. Finely dressed. Nityam. Always. <clears throat> Parimrishka cleansed. Parichada garments and household utensils. Kamai according to the desires of the husband. Ucha of Ajayi both great and small. Sadbi. A chaste woman. Tashrayena. With modesty. Damina. By controlling the senses. Cha. Also. Vakyai. By speech. Satyai. Truthful. Priyaihi, very pleasing. Himna, with love. Kale, kale, at appropriate times. Bhajet, should worship. Patim, her husband. Translation. A chaste woman must dress nicely and decorate herself with golden ornaments for the pleasure of her husband. Always wearing clean and attractive garments, she should sweep and clean the household with water and other liquids so that the entire house is always pure and clean. 
She should collect the household paraphernalia and keep the house always aromatic with incense and flowers and must be ready to execute the desires of her husband. Being modest and truthful, controlling her senses and speaking in sweet words, a chaste woman should engage in the service of her husband with love according to time and circumstances. Please allow us to speak. So let's go over this translation again. A chaste woman must dress nicely and decorate herself with golden ornaments for the pleasure of her husband. Now, some ladies have told me in the past that their husband doesn't like it when they dress up too much. So we should be malleable, flexible, um, you know, uh, mold ourselves to our husband's tastes and desires. So whatever he feels is beautiful and attractive, um, that's what we should do. One thought I had when we were reading this about decorating ourselves with golden ornaments for the pleasure of our husband, uh, one thing I thought of was that the husband is the provider for the wife. And so if she dresses nicely and uh, decorates herself nicely, then the husband feels happy that she's making use of the gifts he has given her. That's one way to look at it. Always wearing clean and attractive garments. So that means, clean means that we haven't worn those cl clothes while passing stool or, um, I mean, there are other ways to get moochie like eating and sleeping, so we should make sure that our clothes that we put on are fresh, and also that the body is clean, wearing clean garments. If we put dirty clothes on a clean body, oh, the internet connection is unstable. So if we put clean clothes on top of a dirty body, or if we put dirty clothes on a clean body, then it's like an elephant taking a, a bath and then throwing dirt on his body. So we don't want to do that. We want to be clean, clean body and have clean clothes as well. And that helps uplift our consciousness. Besides, many of us, we are the pujari in our household. Many of us ladies, we do the pujari service. And so we have to be clean. She should sweep and clean the household with water and other liquids so that the entire house is always pure and clean. So to the best of our ability, we should do this early in the morning. Srila Prabhupada corrected some devotees at one temple, one time when they were all chanting Japa early in the morning and the temple was dirty. Srila Prabhupada asked about it and um, the person in charge said, well, Srila Prabhupada, they're all chanting their japa now, and after that, then they will clean. 
And Prabhupada said, tell them to stop jumping and get started cleaning. It should be done early in the morning. So to the best of our ability, we should clean early in the morning. So a chaste wife should collect the household paraphernalia and keep the house always aromatic with incense and flowers. In the word for word synonyms, Parichada. Parichada means garments and household utensils. So the wife is supposed to collect the clothing for everyone in the house and the household utensils, the things that we use to work inside the house should be chosen and accumulated by the wife. And she must be ready to execute the desires of her husband. One time, Srila Prabhupada said that a wife should be ready to um, obey the whims of her husband. That, that went into my heart and stayed there. And I noticed that, that sometimes it seems rather whimsical what the husband asks us to do, but we should be ready to execute even whimsical little desires of our husband. And you know that attitude of always being ready to serve our husband and please him in every respect, it comes automatically when we are the well-wisher of our husband as it said in the previous verse, which we studied some time ago, to render service to the husband, to be always favorably disposed toward the husband. Um, these are principles to be followed by women described as chaste. So in order to be able to be in the mood of always being ready to serve our husband, no matter what he asks, that comes more easily if we cultivate uh, the mood of always being favorably disposed toward him, always wishing him well, always praying for him, always thinking of his comforts and his uh, happiness. Being modest and truthful being modest, modest. When I was young, my mother taught me that modesty means chastity. It means to, um, to dress in such a way and to behave in such a way that we're not showing off our body or our Laughter, me, offensive. Hold on, I'm going to turn on my fan. Does anyone else have an idea, an understanding of what modesty is? You can say, please. Who can give a definition of modest or modesty? Mataji, not uh, try, talking about oneself or drawing attention to oneself uh, too much? That's a very good idea. That's a very good answer. That's very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Shraddha. Okay, so now what about being truthful? Truthful has many um, indications like for one 
Truthfulness means to be obedient to her husband. Um, truthfulness also should be, mm, we should be selective about what we say to our husband, because if we're too truthful, we may hurt him, hurt his feelings, hurt his sensitive masculine pride. So there, in the, in the type of case where the husband may be uh, uh, offended by us being too truthful, uh, we should practice diplomacy. Srila Prabhupada said that there is much diplomacy in marriage, but he also said that diplomacy used in the service of Krishna is a kind of devotional service. So if we hold back some things, that's okay. Uh, the point is to speak sweetly and at the same time to be uh, obedient. I hope that was clear. Controlling her senses, the Menacha. We came across that phrase in Devahuti's chapter when we were reading about Srimati Devahuti, how she served her husband with intimacy and great respect, with control of the senses, with love and with sweet words. Even though Srila Prabhupada says in many places that there is no love in this uh, material world, he also in many places says that there is love between husband and wife and between mother and child. So Sometimes it may be a little hard for us to understand if we are too analytical in our thinking, but uh, like uh, Bhakti Charu Maharaj said in that one little um, talk that he gave, he said, love is an energy. So when we direct that energy toward the person that we're trying to show love for, then it um, becomes pleasing to Krishna. Krishna is pleased when we try to love our husband and love our children and serve them nicely in Krishna consciousness for the pleasure of Krishna. Speaking in sweet words, again, this is such an important quality of a chaste wife, is that she speaks in sweet words. She doesn't chastise her husband for being late when he comes home late. She doesn't um, say cruel or sarcastic words to him when he forgets to do something that he promised to do, or even when he speaks harsh words toward her, she controls her speech and practices silence until he calms down. And then she can speak if it's appropriate. A chaste woman should engage in the service of her husband with love, according to time and circumstances. So again, here's that word love. Srila Prabhupada is using it occasionally, especially when he's talking about husbands and wives, and also parents and children. So now, Let's go back to text 25 and read the purport again. The purport to a 7, 11, 25. Srila Prabhupada says, it is very important for peaceful householder life 
that a woman follow the vow of her husband. Now, again, many uh, vow, the vow of the husband can mean many different things. It can mean his word, his instruction. It can mean the vows that he has taken at initiation or uh, some rut that he has decided to follow. Uh, it can also mean, according to Bhaktivedya Purna Maharaj, it can mean the duties that are characteristic of the husband's varna. So I've given this example before my friend upstairs. She was brought up in a Kshatriya family, but she married into a Brahmin family. And so she has had to learn how to be like a Brahmini. And she's learned so much. So she, in that way, follows very strictly the vow of her husband or the varna of her husband. Any disagreement with the husband's vow will disrupt family life. So any disagreement with the husband's uh, tastes or his nature or his uh, behavior, so many things. But uh, this is specifically talking about his vow. It means his determination, his determination. If he wants to accomplish something, he's very determined about it. He has vowed to do it. If the wife disagrees with that, and she puts forward her disagreement, then it can cause some trouble in the marriage. So a wife should be very careful about how she presents an opposing point of view, or an opposing uh, view as far as the vow of the husband. It's quite an extensive topic, but let's go on to the next sentence. In this regard, Shaniki Pandit gives a very valuable instruction. Sampatyo kalaho nasti tatra shrihi swayam agataha. When there are no fights between husband and wife, the goddess of fortune automatically comes to the home. So how can we keep from fighting? How can we uh, refrain from fighting with our husband? especially if he's the one who picks the fight and he taunts us and pokes at us with his words. It takes tremendous tolerance. And we have to have the patience and the tolerance of Mother Earth sometimes, it feels like. So, but Krishna can help us. Krishna is the one who has told us that we need to be um, sweet, sweetly spoken. So Krishna, because he has given us that instruction, he can also empower us to follow it. Srila Prabhupada once either said or wrote that the, when there are no fights between husband and wife, the goddess of fortune chooses of her own accord to come and stay in that home. So not only does it mean uh, that the goddess of fortune, she comes and brings with her Lakshmi, but it also means that she brings all kinds of auspiciousness, peacefulness, happiness, opulence in many kinds of ways, beauty. So there are so many wonderful qualities of Lakshmi Devi that when she stays in the home, become manifest. A woman's education should be conducted 
along the lines indicated in this verse. So if we have daughters, we should be training our daughters according to this verse so that they can at least know what the goal is. If a girl is brought up without knowing what ideal behavior for a woman is, then it can cause great difficulty in her life. So it's our responsibility to train our daughters. The basic principle for a chaste woman is to be always favorably disposed toward her husband. So the basic principle for a chaste woman is to be her husband's well-wisher, to always be agreeable toward him and uh, encouraging, sweet-natured. And we know that um, it pleases our husband if we are happy and cheerful and our eyes are sparkling and our smile is bright. So those are different ways that we can be favorably disposed toward our husband. In Bhagavad Gita 140, it is said, Trishu Dushtasu Varshneya Jayate Varna Sankaraha. If the women are polluted, there will be Varna Sankara population. So, first of all, Srila Prabhupada is talking about chaste women, and then he talks about unchaste women. So what happens when the women are unchaste or they, they put themselves in a position or society puts themselves, puts the women in a position to potentially be taken advantage of and polluted. Polluted means to be made pregnant um, out of wedlock and uh, thus potentially producing a Varna Sankara child. In modern terms, <clears throat> the Varna Sankara are the hippies who do not follow any regulative injunctions. Another explanation is that when the population is Varna Sankara, no one can know who is on what platform. That reminds me of how Srila Prabhupada taught us how to understand what is a woman's position in society. If she is, um, if she is wearing her hair parted in the middle, it is understood to be um, that she is married. If she parts her hair on the side, it is understood that she is a prostitute. If she covers her head with her pillow, she is recognized as being married. And what's the point of showing, like if you're out in public or if someone comes to your home, then that person can immediately recognize, oh, this woman uh, is married. Uh, if she has her head uncovered and uh, she is not wearing sindoor and kumkum or bindi, then that means she is not married. If she's wearing white, that means her husband has either died or taken sannyas. So in these ways, one can understand the position of a woman in Vedic society, in Krishna's culture. The Varnashram system scientifically divides society into four Varnas and four Ashramas. But in Varnasangara society, there are no such distinctions and no one can know who is who. In such a society, 
No one can distinguish between a Brahmin, a Chatriya, a Vaishya, and a Shudra. For peace and happiness in the material world, the Varnashram institution must be introduced. The symptoms of one's activities must be defined and one must be educated accordingly. Then spiritual advancement will automatically be possible. So we may have, you know, many of you girls were brought up in India. So many of you were probably trained properly in the duties of a chaste wife, but some of us were not. So then we have to learn from others. We have to learn from each other. We have to learn from our spiritual master, from Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, and then try to implement those uh, principles in our life. Then spiritual advancement will automatically be possible. Why? Because when one understands his duty in society, then he doesn't have to waste time and energy being on the mental platform. His, his duties are fixed and understood, so his mind is more peaceful, and therefore he can pursue spiritual matters more easily. Okay, so now we're going to turn to the secrets of fascinating womanhood. Okay, so we're on. <clears throat> okay, now somebody told me last week, and if I just type in the number here, it still won't allow me to do it. So I'll just have to Still, it's not working. Oh, Krishna. Okay. Mataji, should I share like last time? I think you're going to have to because it still won't allow me to use my mouse to scroll. Okay, let me do that. One second. Which page uh, should I go to? Okay, uh, we were on, let's start on page 122. Thank you. You make it look so easy. Okay, so now I wanna scroll a little bit. Okay. So let's see, Angela made a goal list. Did everyone make their goal list? I did. It's, I very much enjoy doing this. I do it every once in a while. Um, the teacher in the book goes over her goal list every Sunday night. I don't do that, but you know, I do it fairly frequently. And uh, one nice thing about uh, setting a goal for yourself is that if you put it in writing, 
and it goes into your subconscious. And then if you fold it up and put it at Krishna's lotus feet and say, my dear Lord Krishna, if you so desire, please help me to achieve this goal. And then you leave it in Krishna's care and then go back to it after a couple of years. Then you can be sometimes quite surprised about how Krishna has fulfilled your desire and answered your prayer. I've been pleasantly surprised over and over again, time and time again, how Krishna has helped me reach different goals. So the purpose of this goal list is to improve our character um, and to help us prepare our consciousness to receive Krishna's mercy. Srila Prabhupada told our god brother Makanlal to expect Krishna's mercy. But if in our mind we're always um, having negative thoughts, then we may be sabotaging our chances of receiving Krishna's mercy in the form of the realization of our goals. So this kind of process, writing a goal list, for instance, helps us to become more positive and um, to be receptive to Krishna's uh, mercy. Okay. okay, you can scroll down a little bit, shrug off. I'm trusting that everybody did their homework and read the chapter. So motherhood, the most noble and important work on earth. Okay, so the teacher says we are linking hands with God when we become a mother. We are creating eternal beings. Now this is actually not true. The beings are already created, the souls are already created, but this was written by a Christian person. So they have this idea that the soul gets created at the time of conception. Anyway, so uh, children who will live forever. Yes, that's correct. The, our children are eternal souls. They will live forever. And so then she says, yes, we mothers join hands with God as we bring his children into the world. He has given us the great responsibility of training their trusting little minds. So that's true. The mother is the first guru for the child. So we should always be not only teaching our children, but we should be following ourselves. We should be a good example of a disciple, uh, not only for our spiritual master, for, but also for our Pati Guru. So you can scroll down. Okay, stop. Let's see where we are here. Okay, you can scroll down a little farther. I'm not sure why I'm not seeing my... Uh, Oh, this is important. Never express regret for becoming pregnant. You have to be so careful uh, to always be positive. Of course, as devotees, we plan our pregnancies. We chant 50 rounds before we conceive. So our children are wanted. So they're always confident. Our children are so confident. Uh, in our love. They're confident that we love them. And, um, and they, they grow up with um, good self-esteem. Um, so, so that's not a problem for a lot of our children. But sometimes a child may come to us so-called accidentally. If that happens, be joyful. 
take it as Krishna's mercy that uh, this child was meant to be in our family. So we should welcome this soul and try to help this soul become Krishna conscious. <clears throat> Okay, so let's see. Yeah, you can scroll down. Secret number six, your God-given role is that of mother and homemaker. Enjoy it. So the role of mother is very, very sweet and enjoyable. And for those of you who have not had that experience, if you still have a chance, please take it. <clears throat> the role of homemaker can be very, very enjoyable, even though uh, housework is a, a repetitive, it can be repetitive. Still, if we do it with love for Krishna, then it can be a source of great joy to us and satisfaction when we see a beautiful clean house and we have uh, done our cleaning while chanting Krishna's holy names and praying to Krishna to please accept our humble service. And it's very pleasing to our hearts as well. Okay, you can scroll down, Shraddha. Motherhood and homemaking are our lifelong career. To enjoy our role as women, we need to accept that motherhood and homemaking are, is our God-given career. Our families really depend on us to fill this role well. We should take a pride in this career and do it well and do it femininely. Most women who don't enjoy motherhood or homemaking are either too rushed for time or are being influenced by media into thinking that managing a home is unfulfilling. So that's a, that's a lot of information in that one little paragraph. So we, um, if we're like this girl in the class, her name is Beth, she said to the teacher that she would go crazy if she had to stay home all the time. But actually, actually, I've never felt like that. I don't know if I'm different, but I've always enjoyed being at home. And um, I really enjoy having a clean house. And not only is it pleasing to me, but it's pleasing to my husband. I have to admit though, that having been brought up in a family of 10 children, um, my mother didn't have a lot of time to teach me different things. She did teach me how to do certain things like dusting and polishing wooden furniture with uh, oil. Um, so that was very useful and it made everything smell so good. Um, she taught me how to use a vacuum cleaner because in our houses in America, we had carpet. So we had to learn how to use a, a vacuum cleaner on the carpets. So she taught me that. And um, she taught me how to clean glass windows on the inside and the outside. So that's also a very useful thing to know. There's a lady call, who calls herself Fly Lady. She's on the internet. And she teaches women how to keep their houses clean and orderly. And it's a, <clears throat> it's a lot of fun to work with Fly Lady because she makes it uh, kind of like a game. So I would um, enthusiastically urge anyone who is having trouble um, feeling enthusiastic to clean their home. If you, um, if you 
log on to Fly Lady. It's F L Y. Uh, F L Y stands for finally loving yourself. So Fly Lady, she's actually from North Carolina, where I used to live, and where my daughter lives, and she's a really happy, fun person. So tune in to Fly Lady and see if you can get some good ideas how to enjoy your homemaking service. Okay, so let's scroll and let's read here. Um, our natural feminine instincts are to enjoy motherhood and homemaking. Nearly all young girls enjoy playing with dolls and doll houses. And when I was little, I didn't play with dolls so much because my mother always had a baby for me to play with or to take care of. So I was very fortunate because I had eight little siblings, one after another, to, um, to mother. I got to be a little mother from the time I was very small. So I was so fulfilled in that way. But um, people who just have one or two children, uh, their little girl may not get so much of a chance to be a mommy, to practice being a mother. So, um, so you may have to provide other ways for your daughter to learn how to be a mother. If we're crowded for time by going out to work or by poor organization, we are robbed of the enjoyment of being, you know, of enjoying our motherhood and our homemaking. So if we're working outside the home, or even if we're working inside the home uh, at a job and it's taking us away from our household duties and away from our children, then we should try to uh, pass that over to our husband as soon as possible because our husband should be the one who is the provider. It, that's his duty and men are so good at it. They're so good at it. My husband was such a good provider, hard worker, and very intelligent about how to make money, how to attract luxury to come into his hands. He was very good at that. And um, so we gradually learn how to uh, take on our own responsibilities that Krishna has given us. And if we do, then we can become more peaceful, more happy. And our husband can be more peaceful and happy too. Okay, Shraddha, you want to scroll down? Okay, stop. I see no lasting happiness in a career outside the home. Okay, so the young girl, Beth, she's disagreeing with what the teacher is saying. She says, you're all beginning to sound like my mother. Homemaking is not for every woman, she says. As you know, I study and work full time. I work in a law office part time. And when I graduate and qualify as a lawyer early next year, I've been offered a full time job <coughs> with them. I'm having a baby soon, but I'm still going to continue my career after my baby's born. My husband supports my decision. I've put too many years into my career to give up now. Okay, so this is a common uh, song, a common song and dance that we often hear. So I hope that this girl Beth is not gonna learn the hard way. Learning the hard way, by that I mean already having her baby, falling in love with her baby, head over heels, feeling broken and torn to have to leave her baby in someone else's care so that she can go to work. That is just too painful for a woman who is feminine, who loves her children. It's just too 
to excruciatingly painful. And I've seen women who have gone back to work after a month or after six months or after a year, and they're thinking constantly about their child. They're not focusing on their work. They're not getting satisfaction out of their work, out of their job. They're just thinking about when can I go home and be with my baby? So if we're intelligent, we'll make an arrangement in our life how to give up this idea of following a career or having a job outside of motherhood and wifehood. Being a housewife is actually a very fulfilling um, type of work. And uh, it's not only self and fulfilling for the woman herself, but it's satisfying to her husband and it's satisfying to her children. Okay, you can scroll down, shred up. <clears throat> mm, that was a good piece of advice. Up a little bit higher. Okay, right here. So Harmony is suggesting to Beth, could I suggest that you be courageous and ask your husband to tell you honestly what he would really prefer you to do? Your child and any future children you bring into the world are going to need a full-time mother more than this world needs another lawyer. Children last forever. I'm sure the love between you and your husband will also last forever. Okay, so that was very, very good advice from Harmony. Now you can scroll down. Everyone probably read this quote from Taylor Caldwell. So Taylor Caldwell was a frustrated working woman, career woman, and apparently she never got to be mother. She never got to be a wife. She, she laments in her old age that, oh, if only I had had the opportunity of cooking a good meal for a man and bringing it to him with love. Um, so this is just uh, a natural position for a girl to want to be married, to want to be a mother, and to uh, fulfill her, her femininity in those two roles. Okay, so this is a sweet story that uh, Spencer Kimball told. Spencer Kimball, I had never heard of him, but anyway, he told this story about how he went to a, a town where he was supposed to give a seminar. And uh, it wasn't time for the seminar when he arrived. So he went to the house of the, um, the preacher. And um, the preacher told him, just make yourself comfortable. And he said, okay. So he started uh, preparing for his talk that evening. And while he was sitting in the, um, inside the house, a child came to the door. It was a young boy and he said, mother. And um, a warm, loving voice from upstairs said, I'm up here, dear. Do you want something? And the little boy said, nothing, mother. And he slammed the door and went out to play. Then a few minutes later, the door opened again and another boy stepped in who was a little older. He said, mother. And then she said, here I am, darling. Do you want something? No, was the reply. And the door closed again and another child went out to play. Then another child opened the door and said, mother. And the mother said, I'm up here, darling. I'm ironing. That seemed to satisfy this young girl completely and she went about her piano practice. A little later, there was a fourth voice, a 17 year old girl's voice. The call upstairs was repeated and the same mother's voice responded. 
But the girl just sat down at the living room table, spread out her school books, and began studying. So Spencer Kimball's point is, mother was home. That was the important thing. Here was security. Here was everything the child seemed to need. So it's important for our children that we be home when they're home. So whatever you need to do, if you're not, if you, that arrangement is not already in place, put it in place for the sake of your children. And if you put it in place for the sake of your children, then your mind will be more peaceful. Okay, so now Angela tells about how she feels guilty working and she feels guilty staying at home because all of her friends work. So the class laughed and the teacher smiled and, and uh, she said, when you're in step with the world, you're out of step with God. Okay, you can scroll down, Shraddha. So then uh, she says, fascinating womanhood brings us back into step with God back into step with truth and goodness. I sometimes think on the day of judgment, that means when you see Yamaraj, when you leave your body, if you're gonna have to see Yamaraj, then what is he gonna be more concerned with? How many words you typed per minute in your office job? Or how well you raised your precious children? So remember God's plan, the man provides and the woman nurtures. We are both happiest in our distinct roles. Okay. How to avoid being bored at home. Okay, let's scroll down a little farther. Oh, okay, so Harmony's suggestion is that you find a friend, a friend who's also a stay-at-home mom. And if necessary, you can find more than one friend. Make friendships with other women who are also young mothers. Um, and in that way, you can organize get-togethers and uh, have time to talk with each other sometimes cry on each other's shoulder. You know, sometimes if you're like pent up with all kinds of uh, anxiety and stress, if you just tell a good friend, it can greatly relieve your stress. I know you've all experienced that. Okay, so then um, mingle together, sew together, exercise together, learn together, just as we are tonight, or even just chat together, talk. That's how friendships are built. Okay, so even if you only have one close friend, uh, do um, make an arrangement for that in your life. If you don't have anybody, pray to Krishna to send you someone who's compatible with you, someone who can relate to you someone who's like-minded and make friendship with that person. Okay. Our husbands are our friend as um, we read in the Kardamamuni and Devahuti's chapter, the husband is an intimate friend, um, but he's not our girlfriend. So with the husband, we have to always strike that balance between intimacy and great respect. Vishrambena and Gaurabena. So that's, that's different from having a girlfriend. A girlfriend, or like I, 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 I like to call my girlfriends, my soul sisters. So um, I have a few soul sisters who I reveal my mind to now and then, and it gives uh, a great feeling of relief when you know life has become tense and stressful. Okay, now Marina asks a question. She says, uh, 
Sometimes I think I would like to live like those women in native villages who are always mingling together, washing clothes in the river and collecting water from the well. They always look so happy on TV, just following the traditions of their mothers, no stress. Okay, so, you know, I think of Nandagram and um, the other uh, farm communities in India where devotees have uh, uh, set up their, their lives and their, they've built their homes there, they've learned, or they're learning how to grow food and um, learning how to take care of cows and bulls. This is such a happy life, such a wonderful life. So and my husband and I, we tried to buy some land here in Karnataka and we had so much trouble because we're Westerners. Um, so we ended up not being able to do that. So now we just live in an apartment. But um, for those of you who are able to, uh, I strongly urge you to, to seriously consider living off the land as Srila Prabhupada wanted us to do and um, uh, taking care of cows. Your minds will be more peaceful and uh, you'll get along with your husband and your children better because everybody will be more happy. So that's a nice uh, point that Marina made. Okay, so let's, um, okay, here we go. Let's sum up, she says, let's sum up what we've covered so far. First, fascinating womanhood teaches us that we achieve far more by staying home and building up our husband and children than by going out into the workforce and joining the hunt with men. No success in a career can ever compensate for failure in our home. That is true. Secondly, we are generally more pleasant wives for our husbands to come home to if we have at least one friend to talk to during the day, even if it's only by phone. Close friends are vital. So personally, I'm not a, a telephone talking type of person, but I do use WhatsApp. And I find it very satisfying and fulfilling to stay in touch with all of you um, through WhatsApp. And um, I agree wholeheartedly with this second principle that it's good to have a girlfriend or girlfriends. Thirdly, staying home gives us free time to be with our friends, to enjoy our children, to read in the sunshine, to listen to music, to create or play our own music, to enjoy our hobbies, and to develop our skills and educate ourselves. So those are all wonderful things that we can engage ourselves in that keep us fresh and youthful and bright-eyed. We're always um, feeling our creativity satisfied, then we can be more pleasing to our husband when he comes home. Okay. Overall, we feel far less pressured and store up lovely memories of treasured moments with our children. We become more feminine and therefore more delightful to our husbands. Okay, let's scroll down to men's most common complaint about their wives. Organization. Many women have difficulty organizing themselves. I know it is hard at times with all the demands made upon us, especially by our children, but most men with their orderly minds are very intolerant of disorganized women. It's the most common complaint they make against us. Okay, so that is very good to know. Very good to know that our husbands actually appreciate to have an orderly, clean atmosphere. Okay, so there's a simple way to become organized. That is to write down the things we need to do the moment we decide to do them. 
Now this takes discipline. You have to stop yourself when, when Super Soul tells you something that you need to do. You, you need to have the discipline to stop what you're doing and go write it down. And if you do that, then it takes it off of your mind and you don't have to keep trying to remember it. Okay? So in that way, we show appreciation to Lord Paramatma that he gave us that idea. And, um, and then he, you know, appreciates how we came and wrote it down. So there are several ways we can do this. Harmony says, I use one of those small desktop calendar planner diaries that some businessmen use. You know, the ones with the little ring binder that sit on a wooden or plastic base and you turn over a new page each day. I keep mine next to my bed and I have a pen tied to it with a string. It doesn't look very elegant, but it works a treat. I guess that must be a uh, common saying in England. Uh, it works well, it works nicely. Or you can keep it in the kitchen if you like, as long as you see it every day. Or you can use a book type diary. I did that for a while, she says. The kind that opens to a full week at a time is good. That's called, in America, they call that a day timer. We used to use those when we were in business. You can also take it with you when you go out, but it's too easy to forget where you put it. I never lose my wooden one. It's always in the same place next to my bed. Whenever I get ideas or have things to do or something to buy at a future time, I go and write it down on my calendar on the exact day I need to do it. Then I don't have to worry anymore about remembering it. And every night I sit up in bed and cross things off that I've accomplished that day. That's so satisfying. And I transfer the things that I didn't get done to another day on the calendar. Then I can relax and go to sleep with a peaceful mind. Okay, so I don't use a day timer or a desktop calendar. I use pieces of paper. My husband, he is, um, He's an artist and he is creating beautiful works of art and sometimes he has scraps of paper so he gives me those scraps of paper and I use those for my daily lists and so when I get up in the morning early I write down things that come to my mind that I have to uh, do during the day and then before I start my day's activities after I finish, you know, uh, my early morning sadhana, then I write a full list of everything that I need to do during the day. And the thing that helps me to, uh, um, to remember what to write is I go by yesterday's list. I keep yesterday's list and I look at it and I say, okay, I have to take my medicines. I have to finish my chapa. I have to do my reading. Um, I have to sweep and mop. I have to cook, clean the kitchen, do the puja, all those things. And uh, whatever I did or didn't do, I copy down on today's list because a lot of the things are things that I do every day. Okay, so that's a, a really good uh, method. And many people recommend doing it the night before. So this is something that I have never gotten good at. I generally find that uh, I tend to put off making my list until the next day, uh, the morning. But um, some people write their list the night before because then it gives um, their subconscious a chance to uh, work on it and prepare for their next day while they're sleeping. So it's actually a really good idea. Okay, so let's scroll down. Okay, so uh, what men want from their wives as homemakers? 
Now, said the teacher, let's quickly look at some of the feminine skills we need to master to be successful as mothers and homemakers and to keep our husbands and families content. First, <coughs> meal preparation. How organized are we? Men look forward to coming home to a tasty meal that is ready on time. But even the most placid husband, that means like a peaceful, uh, easygoing guy, even the most placid husband will get very annoyed with his wife when she is so disorganized that she's always running late with the meals. So this is very important. Uh, my husband is a very uh, humble and tolerant person when it comes to me having meals ready on time. He, um, he likes to have it ready at a certain time, but if I'm running a little late, the, when I'm running a little late, then I peek out of the kitchen and I say, Prabhuji, uh, I, it's going to be a little late today. And so then at least he's aware, he knows. So we should be at least courteous enough to let them know when we're going to be a little late, having the meal ready. But we should try as hard as we can to be always on time. And that means starting early enough. If you're um, able to start early enough, then you'll be ready on time. Okay, let's scroll down. Okay. Oh, that was interesting. Scroll up just a teeny bit, uh, Shraddha. Should we ask? Where is that? Should we ask our husbands to help us with the housework? Oh, there it is. Diane spoke. Should we ask our husbands to help us with the housework? Harmony says, no, we shouldn't ask him to help us with the normal housework. We are talking about things like the dishes and vacuuming the floors. Unless it is a masculine job or requires a lot of strength, wait for him to offer. If he doesn't offer, we should just accept that. We must remember that the housework is our area of responsibility, not his. He has his own responsibilities to take care of. However, we will find that as our husband's love and tenderness for us increases, the more inclined he will be to offer to help us. Okay, scroll down. How to be more interesting to your husband. So let's see, don't, let's see. Anyway, oh, so she's just talking about reading and uh, acquainting ourselves with uh, uh, current events in the world and, you know, being up on uh, what's happening in the news and being able to talk a little bit about it with our husband. And then she also points out that we should do something that's satisfying to us, uh, to our creative uh, inclinations and talents. So then uh, Diane tells about how she's been learning how to arrange, make uh, artificial flower arrangements. So that's satisfying to her. Okay. I know I also like to do um, creative activities that keeps my mind and my heart happy and fresh. I like to write and uh, I also like to make music. It's been a long time since I did that, but um, it's still satisfying to me that I in the past got to make um, my own recordings. And, Post them on SoundCloud. So, oh, and also sewing, or as they say here in India, stitching. Uh, it's very fun and satisfying to create something beautiful with your hands by um, using cloth and needle and thread, or if you have a sewing machine, using that. Cooking. Cooking is really fun. I enjoy so much. Uh, creating beautiful, uh, tasty dishes and offering them, trying to offer with love to my deities. And then 
hearing my husband express satisfaction and pleasure when he tastes the delicious dishes. So there are many ways in which we can feel happy and content. Okay, scroll down. Men respect motherhood. Yes, we should always understand that our, our role as mothers is a glorious and noble role. Okay, let's scroll down a little more. Remember your spiritual growth? Well, that's our whole focus in Krishna consciousness is our spiritual growth. So yeah, we're always thinking of how to become more and more Krishna conscious, how to help our husband be more Krishna conscious, how to help our children become more Krishna conscious, how to help our friends become more Krishna conscious. So yes, this is very, very important. How to be treated with respect by professionals. I, uh, I have noticed here in India uh, that sometimes, uh, I don't know exactly how to put it. I've complained sometimes, a couple times to my husband about how when he and I go out together, all the merchants are very respectful to me. And when I'm going out alone, they're not always respectful. So uh, anyway, I guess the best thing is to be Krishna conscious. To take whatever comes as uh, a small portion of what we deserve. Okay, let's scroll down. 10 rules for raising well balanced children. So read over those yourselves. We're running out of time. It's, uh, if you haven't read them yet, please read through these 10 rules. Okay. Now, let's uh, read the assignments. Obtain a desktop calendar, planning diary with a page for each day, or a similar planning aid and plan out your next two weeks. So this was the homework for today. So um, I would like to hear what some of you did to um, help yourselves become more organized. Some of you are extremely organized and I, my hat's off to you. You're more organized than I am. I'm really, really impressed and proud of you. Um, but you know, there, be, there may be others who need a little help in that area. So I would like to hear how you applied this assignment this week. So please share on the Power of Inspiration group something that you did to become more organized this week, something that you'll be able to implement for the rest of your life. Okay, scroll down, shut off. Assignment two, if you go out to work to a job, list all the advantages of giving it up. Ask your husband to read the list and tell you honestly how he feels. Okay, so some of you do have jobs outside the home, and some of you have already approached your husbands and asked them to please take over uh, providing for the family. Now, there may have been um, varying degrees of reactions from your husbands, but um, try, try again. Maybe, um, you know, see how see how uh, you can approach him in a more feminine way, in a more detached way, and be ready for any answer that he might give or any reaction he might have to your suggestion, your proposal. And pray to Krishna while you're speaking to him or while you're presenting your, your list to him. Okay, so now let's scroll down. Scroll down. Okay, so this is our home. This is going to be our homework for next week. Please read chapter 10, secret number seven, make the most of yourself. Okay, so chapter 10 is going to be pages 140 to 157. And the assignments are on pages 154 and 155. <coughs> Again, please read chapter 10. 
pages 140 through 157 for next Saturday. That's going to be August 8th. And then um, do the assignments on pages 154 and 155. Please accept my humble obeisances, Vancha Kalpatrubhyas Cha, Kripa Sindhu Bhya Eva Cha, Patitanam Pavane Bhya Vaishnavi Bhya Namon Maha. Thank you everyone for attending the class. I'm very, very happy to have your association and uh, have a wonderful Krishna Conscious week. And we'll be in touch on the Power of Inspiration group. Hari Hari Bo. Thank you, Thank you Ma. Ma. Good night. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Danvat Pranam. Good night, Ma. Thank you. Mataji, Hare Krishna, Danvat Pranam. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Thank you.